Hi there, I'm Simon Morton and I'm a little bit different to your average Kiwi bloke. You see, I love to shop. The idea of browsing, comparing price and quality, finding that something that's just right, it's also exciting. But why do we buy so much and so often? In this series, I'm investigating retail therapy, the motivation and the manipulation. First, I get a heads up on a super seller's gift of the gab and learn the tricks of the trade used by the marketing gurus. I even make a complete fool of myself to see if anyone notices. There's one sort of shopping we do more than any other. We don't like it much, but that didn't stop us spending nearly $10 billion in supermarkets last year. For most of us, supermarket shopping is a chore. You want to get in, get the things you need, and get out. It's a routine where you go into autopilot, and it all starts when you arrive in the car park. Cheeky oh. bugger! Parked in my spot. You may laugh, but when we go to the supermarket to go shopping, most of us like to park in the same place. Why? Because we're creatures of habit. The supermarkets know this, of course, and they take full advantage of it in all sorts of ways once we get inside. But even outside, they get to us by targeting another well-known human weakness, our love of a bargain. Oh, that's a good price. These advertised products are called traffic generators. They're everyday items that people generally know the price of. Oh yeah, bargains. It doesn't matter if the supermarket makes a loss, because the bargains have already done their job. They got us in the front door. And once we're inside, well, that's when the real pressure goes on. We make it easier for the supermarkets because we immediately go into some sort of trance. We don't think, we just do. It's shopping by numbers in what the scientists call a beta state. Now, of course, the supermarkets know all about this. They love it. And like anything to do with our shopping, they spend a lot of time and money researching it. Large bulk of grocery shopping is actually done on what we would say autopilot, whereby people know the colours of their brands, they know what they regularly buy. They'll just reach out, grab that product and put it into the, into the trolley, almost uh, as a matter of, of habit. Now you may be saying, hey, I don't shop like that, I'm in complete control. But the research proves otherwise. Studies measuring shoppers' eye activity, basically how many times they blink, show that people blank out while scanning the shelves and only wake up when they see something familiar. It's like we switch into standby mode until triggered into action. This zombie state is a self-defence mechanism. There's just too much information in here, about 30,000 products in your average supermarket. If we tried taking them all in, we'd hit sensory overload very quickly. Well, we thought we'd investigate the sleepy shopper syndrome. Surely people are going to notice a six-foot-tall gorilla in the supermarket. But will they? So far, not a lot of luck, but come on, you can't miss me. Hello, hello there. Right, this guy's definitely gonna notice me. Gorilla in the bread department? No. I'm back. Oh, this is getting ridiculous. Gorillas don't shave. Right, time to get close. Now surely this lady's gonna notice me. Here we go, in for the peas. No, nothing. Okay, reach across. Here we go, big furry arm. In it goes. And no, bye dear. All right, mate. Well, out of a busy supermarket, just a handful of people took any notice of the gorilla in their midst. 
And even for them, it was like they'd been woken up out of a daydream. If a six-foot gorilla can't get the attention of shoppers, what can? Well, supermarkets have got a few tricks up their sleeves. The science of supermarket shopping is a cunning mix of psychology, research and sales and marketing techniques. They want your money, and you know what? They're going to get it. Nothing in, that happens on a shelf in a supermarket is there by accident. Um, very much we would regard this perhaps as, uh, as a row of apartments, and uh, each of these is a, is a renter, if you like, and we're trying to get maximum return that we can for each of these products that are uh, taking up some of this space. Shoppers on autopilot browse only at eye level, so competition is hot for this prime real estate. We can't be bothered looking up or down, so this is where the less popular stuff goes. How the shelves are laid out is also dictated by the dollar. This computer, called a Spaceman, calculates the profit to be made by placing different items in different spots. The supermarkets know more about the way we shop than we do, and they just love making it easier for us to spend up large. Typically the shopper will actually uh, slow down around the end of the aisle. That's really because they've learnt that uh, a lot of promotions, a lot of uh, discounted products typically will sit on the end of the aisle, and they'll tend to move slowly into the aisle and speed up as they get down towards the end of the aisle. So obviously it's in the uh, supplier's interests to be nearer the end of an aisle as possible. End of aisles are known as gondolas. Manufacturers pay to have their products here, and you'll have noticed some supermarkets split their aisles in the middle, creating twice as many gondolas. Clever! But wait, there's more! Oh yes, supermarkets are full of bright ideas, some bordering on the downright devious. Ever noticed how the basic necessities are placed so far apart that you have to walk past everything else to get to what you're really after? Well, this increases the chance of impulse buying. It also means you stay longer in the shop and supermarkets know that more time equals more money. But wait! What's happening behind me here is actually not happening by accident at all. What we've got is your beer products here and then right across the aisle is the salty snacks. It's called category adjacency, putting products that are related in terms of their consumption together to promote sales of one or the other or ideally both. No one likes buying more than a full trolley load. So what did the supermarkets do? That's right, bigger trolleys. But one thing they're not big on is clocks. And there are not a lot of clocks in supermarkets, no. It's, uh, it's a case of, you know, they really want you to, to forget about the time and uh, just enjoy the experience and uh, hopefully spend as long as you possibly can there. Creating the ideal supermarket environment also includes playing the right music. Nice and easy. Slow tempo. Come on, baby, relax, take your time. Buy some more stuff. Ooh, they look good. It can also be aromas, um, particularly coming out of bakery departments and some of the areas that can help entice you into an area. Traditionally, bakeries would bake in the morning, whereas here, they're baking all day long. And it's not just to get products on the shelves. It's for the environment, the, the smell. I'm feeling a bit hungry already. Well, that's me done for the next 2.9 days. That's the average gap between our supermarket trips. No more weekly shops. We're in there all the time. Even though we're only after a couple of things, we usually buy more than expected. So overall, our spend is up. Just look at me. Now, I only came in for bread and milk, but I got in there, got into autopilot mode, the supermarket sales strategies kicked in, and before I knew it, I bought lots of stuff impulsively, just like 98% of us do. OK, so those are some of the sales techniques used for selling on a big, impersonal supermarket scale. But what about shopping for other stuff? Things we really like. What makes us buy then? And what are some of the techniques used by the best salespeople? Well, you may be surprised. To understand why we buy, we have to understand the secrets of selling. All those cunning ways of getting us to part with our cash. For instance, the limit tag. It's a tactic that you often see at the supermarket. It implies the product is such a bargain that either, to be fair, or so they don't run out too quickly, the retailer has had to limit the number each customer can buy. A genuine concern or a sales tactic? What do you think? 
Studies show that by simply placing a limit tag on an item, sales will jump by 40%. So we decided to try our own limit experiment inside this wine shop. First, the wine was put out at its usual price with no limit tag, just a price sticker. In a week, they sold 16 bottles, pretty much what they expected. The next week, we added a limit three tag, but the price per bottle stayed the same. Well, it was an interesting result. Um, the, uh, the first week, I guess you could say, we, we had uh, normal sales on a wine like that. And the second week, perhaps somewhat surprising um, from my point of view, I, I guess we sold almost double the amount that we did the, uh, the previous week. Maggie, good afternoon. Good afternoon. These look nice. Yes, yeah, superb wine. So in week one, with no limit tag, the shop sold 16 bottles of this wine. Week two, by simply adding a limit three tag, they sold 27 bottles of the wine, an impressive 68% increase in sales. Not everyone bought three, but most people seem to buy more than one, which perhaps is what they'd normally buy. But why does the limit three sign work? Well, it's something called the scarcity principle. Basically, if we think something's going to run out, human nature tells us to stock up. We might not need it, but our instinct says it's the right thing to do. But the thing is, we're fooling ourselves. Research shows that if we buy in bulk, we just use the products more quickly. Again, it's psychology at work. We think we've got a bargain, so we're more relaxed about consuming it faster. The idea of pretending something is scarce is nothing new. Super saleswoman Suzanne Paul knows it well. I used to do a demonstration with a jewellery collection and we spent the whole demonstration saying it's not available for sale. And people felt so relaxed watching this demonstration because it was all, oh, I haven't got to buy anything, I haven't got to part with any cat. We just want you to have a look, that's what we used to say, I just want you to see it. And always at the end then, people would say, well, why can't I buy that necklace? Because I really, well, I'm not supposed to, but I can see that you really want it, so okay. And so that was another way of selling, to tell people that it's not for sale, they want it. <laughs> I was born ready. It's so easy. You just shake the pot and then you dust on like with the brush. There's no doubt Suzanne could sell ice to Eskimos or coal to Newcastle. See that absolutely free. And she can certainly flog stuff to us. Well, I have a sneaking suspicion that bargains are going to be flowing out of Suzanne Paul's mouth right now. Yes, they are. They are. <laughs> They're flowing out. And if I dust it on... Now, Since the demise of her tourism foundation. venture in Auckland That's and subsequent to to bankruptcy, she's been back in malls doing what she does best. And what it'll do, even if you've got foundation on, mm. it'll make it look as though you're not wearing any makeup at all. What is the secret of being a really good salesperson? The best salespeople ever are just really happy, lively people. And you just go all the way around making sure it's all... For clean. most people, that's really hard because you can imagine saying the same thing day after day. It's got thousands of luminous spheres week after week, thousands of luminous spheres month after month, thousands of luminous spheres. It is really hard to keep up that Oh, I'm so happy, happy, jolly. What are some of the other techniques you use? Because surely it's a bit more complex than that. It's a little bit. As I say, you've got to really know your product well before you start. It makes your skin look nice and fresh, nice and young, nice and radiant. Also, I think you have to genuinely like people. Close your eyes, Ella. You've got a lovely skin. The one phrase I never use, and I've never used it ever in my life, and I hate people saying it to me, is, can I help you? It drives me absolutely to distraction. I'm like, I don't know, can you? I generally just say, this colour will be perfect on you. Let's just dust right. a bit round there. Just start a conversation. Just, if they're looking at some trousers, just say, oh, by the way, we've got some more over here. But can I help you? Just finishes it all dead for me. The dark town. Well, I can see I'm going to have to brush up on my sales patter okay. because later on I'm going to give it a go myself. Okay. Oh, I'll... oh yeah, I'll do. Oh, yes. right. Okay, so that's for that's one of the problems. I... But before that, let's look at another aspect of sales: pricing. How does the price of something influence whether we buy it or not? We tend to use price as a shortcut when it comes to making buying decisions. If something costs more, then we think it's going to be a better quality. Take, for example, a hundred thousand dollar car. It's got to be better than a $20,000 car. So price is a good indicator most of the time, but it can be used against us. 
I've set up an experiment using two perfumes that smell pretty much the same and both cost $40. I've repackaged them and given them new prices. I'm going to tell people that one's now 150 bucks and the other a snip at just 15 I want to know which one people would buy. Are you sure they're not the same? Definitely not the same. That's sweeter. So... Better. I prefer that one. The more expensive one. You get what you pay for, I like that one. Now to rule out any bias caused by one perfume smelling nicer than the other, I swap them over. Now I'm saying the $15 one is 150 bucks and vice versa. That one. That's a $150 one you buy. Okay. Which one would you buy if you were giving it to someone? <laughs> If I wanted to feel cheap, you mean, or if I was wanting to lash out on the... <laughs> probably buy that one. When I was a lot younger, I'd have bought that one. This one. Really? Yeah. But you prefer... For dollars Yeah. If I was giving it for a gift, I would probably pay more. When I tallied up the results, I found that when the silver perfume was $150, then 83% of people preferred it. But when I said the gold perfume was $150, then 71% of people picked that one. This confirms that people believe the more expensive something is, the better it must be. If something's too cheap, they just won't buy it. Pricing can be more about our expectations of what it should cost than what it actually costs. As we've seen, we're not totally in control when it comes to why we buy. We're influenced by a whole raft of carefully contrived sales and marketing techniques. Often they're designed to play on some aspect of human nature. Take the free trial and product giveaway for example. Freebies make people feel happier, a sales technique in itself. But there's also something else going on called reciprocity. When humans are given something, we feel a basic need to repay the gift, usually in kind. If somebody invites you over for dinner, chances are you'll return the invitation. If somebody buys you a drink or does you a favour, we feel a need to reciprocate. If you ask, you give people the chance to say no. So what's an alternative for canny salespeople? Well, they give something away. Notice how a window washer will wash your window without being asked. They know that some of us will feel obliged to pay, whether we wanted our window cleaned or not. Thank you kindly. And as every window washer knows, by giving something away, you can actually increase sales. Thank you. Cheers. Superseller Suzanne Paul uses a similar technique when she feels it's time to close a deal. So how do you ask for the money? <laughs> Show me the money! <laughs> It's just a feeling I get. Usually I can tell when it's time to close the sale and the best way to do that is to give them an offer that they can't refuse. If you wear that every day on your face, that's going to last you for one year. Oh, okay. So it's great value. They think, wow, that's amazing. You say, but wait, there's more. You'll also get the brush, by the way, which is normally $15. Okay. So it's a gorgeous, nice brush. You know, it's sort of extra, oh, wow, that's amazing. But wait, there's more. <laughs> if you buy today, while stocks last, you've got the gorgeous umbrella. So to close the deal, I give them a really good offer. Just pop it into the lady in the pharmacy okay. and she'll ring that up for All you. Right, okay. Thank you, love. You enjoy that. Bye-bye. Suzanne has a remarkable conversion rate. Out of every ten people she stops, eight or nine of them will buy. But can she teach a complete novice like me? Thirty nine ninety five, you're getting everything. There you go, and you just pop in there and just pay at the cash till okay. over there, and then you just go. Done. <laughs> Looks easy. <laughs> I'm just gonna have a go and see if it can work. Right, I'm ready. Hi there. Will you come over and try some of Suzanne Paul's radiescence? Oh, thank you. Sure. Hello there. Will you come over and try some Su of Suzanne Paul's radiescence? Oh, I see. The hardest part yep. is stopping them. Apart from putting a piece of string across there and actually tripping them up, it's, engaging. it's, it's really, yes, it's stopping them. It's an order. Come and try it. Come over here. Only takes a minute. Excuse me. Could you, could I put some... Really? You don't want to try some... No, no, that's I don't ask yes or no, I just tell them. Order, order, order. 
And then, of course, I always have a good product knowledge. The women love the finish, and you've got to remember this, thousands of luminous spheres. The, uh, what was I going to say? Um, <laughs> the, <laughs> no. It's not too shiny and glimmery, because it's got thousands of luminescent discs. Spheres. Spheres. Yes. Spheres. <laughs> Shoppers can see desperation in your eyes. Well, what about this, you know? What about if I give you that? You know, it's like, gosh, she really wants to sell me. This must be something wrong with it, you know? Hello. Come and try Suzanne Paul's Radiescence. Okay. okay. You can't be too upset or devastated if they don't buy. You won't come through with me to the till. No, I'm sorry. <laughs> oh, no. I'm really sorry. Oh, no. It doesn't matter how happy you are, how positive, how good the product is and how good the deal is. Sometimes people are just not going to buy. Oh, OK, really? no, exactly, exactly. Deep breath. Every no means there's another yes around the corner. That's it, exactly, yes. Glad to come and try the radiescence makeup. If you're honest and if you're nice to people and if your product really does what it says it will do, then the odds are that if you ask enough people, then you will sell enough product. And the whole lot, believe it or not, is £39.95, so... I get one. Do I pay here? Come through here, lovely. I go to the chemist. Great. Yes, yeah, just come in oh, here. Merci beaucoup. Oh, ah, there you go. A vous aussi, merci. Merci beaucoup. Okay. Yes. <laughs> yes. Thank you. Welcome. Yeah. So what have I learnt about the secrets of sales? First, in retail, nothing happens by accident. Salespeople know all our triggers, the aspects of human nature that can be exploited to separate us from our cash. In the supermarket, every square centimetre is laid out to make it oh so easy to buy. And there's an entire industry out there dedicated to helping us shop. And it knows way more about why we buy than we do. Next time on Why We Buy, I look at just that. Why do we buy? Plus, I'll find out what drives the whopping $50 billion a year retail industry. I also test male and female shoppers. And yes, they are very different. And do we buy out of want, need or desire? I go hunting for answers in the strangest of places. It's obviously, what you do here is you don't clean the oven, you just take it to the dump. It's easier. <laughs> Bye. <laughs>